Chapter Five of Beyond These Voices. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Perard. Beyond These Voices by Mary Elizabeth Braddon. Chapter Five. When a woman's imagination, still young and ardent, begins to find the things of earth as Hamlet found them weary flat stale and unprofitable it is only natural that she should turn with a longing mind to the life that earth cannot give the something unseen and mysterious that certain gifted individuals have attributed to themselves the power of seeing vera after six years of marriage six years of unlimited wealth and unconscious self-indulgence had begun to discover that most things were stale and some things weary and all things unprofitable and then to a mind steeped in modern poetry and modern romance and the modern music that always means something more than mere combinations of harmonious sounds there had come a yearning for the higher life the transcendental life that only the elect can realize and only the earth-weary can ardently desire francis simeon was the philosopher to whom she turned with unquestioning faith for even those who had spoken lightly of his creed and of his reasoning faculty had admitted that the man was essentially sincere and that the faith he offered his followers was for him as impregnable as the rock of holy scripture he was announced on the following day as the clock in vera's morning-room struck three a punctuality so exceptional as to seem almost uncanny when compared with the vague sense of time in the rest of her acquaintance she received him in a room where there was no fear of interruption her sanctuary more library than boudoir where the books she loved her poets and novelists and philosophers in the bindings she had herself invented filled her bookcases alternating with black and white portraits of the gods of her idolatry browning tennyson byron scott de musset heine henry irving Gounod. only the dead had place there the dead musician the dead poet the dead actor it was death that made them beloved and longed for they had gone from her reach forever and it was this sense of something forever lost that made them adorable mr simeon looked round the walls with evident admiration i see you prefer the faces of the noble dead to watercolor sketches and majolica plates he said divine books divine faces those are the best companions a woman can have i spent a good deal of my life in this room vera answered i have no children i suppose if i had i should spend most of my time with them i should not have to choose my companions among the dead you have chosen them among the living mr simeon answered in a voice that thrilled her do you think that tennyson is dead he who knew that the whole question of religion hinges upon the afterlife immortality or a godless universe or browning who has gone to the very core of religion whose magnificent mind grasped the highest and deepest in divine love and divine power such spirits are unquenchable this rag of mortality upon which they hang must lie in the dust but for the elect death is only the release of the immaterial from the material the escape of the butterfly from the worm you have the assurance from the lips of christ god is the god of the living and for those whose existence on earth is only the apprenticeship to immortality there is no such thing as death this was the chief article in mr simeon's creed hinted at but not formally stated in his contributions to the magazine which he edited he claimed immortality only for the elect for those in whom the spirit predominated over the flesh to vera there was no new idea in his exposition of faith she had a feeling that she had always known this from the time she stood beside shelley's grave in the shadow of the roman cenotaph and that other grave under the hill the resting-place of shelley's adonais 
the thought of corruption had been far from her mind albeit she knew that the heart of one poet and the wasted form of the other were lying in the darkness below those spring flowers on which her tears were falling and it was no surprise to her to hear a serious man of sixty years of age declare his fate in the unbroken chain of life i saw that you were not one of those who scoff at transcendental truths mr simeon said after a few minutes silence i read in your eyes last night that you are one of us in spirit though you may know nothing of our creed you must join our society your society yes madame provana we are a company of friends in the world of sense and in the world of spirit the majority of us have crossed the river as corporal substance they have ceased to be their dwelling is in the starlight spaces beyond acheron for the common herd they are dead but for us they are as vividly alive as they were when they walked among the vulgar living and wore life's vesture of clay they are nearer to us since they have passed the gulf and we understand them as we never could while they wore the livery of earth they are our close companions the veil that parted us is rent and we see them face to face vera listened in silence and the grave slow speech went on without a break we have our meetings we discuss the great problems the everlasting mysteries we press forward to the higher life we are not afraid of being foolish romantic illogical we are prepared for contempt and incredulity from the outside world but for us whose minds have received the light from those other minds who have been consoled in our sorrows strengthened in our faith by those influencing souls there is nothing more difficult in our creed than in that of newman who saw behind each form of material beauty the light the flower the living presence of an angel the spirits of the illustrious dead are our angels and our communion with them is the joy of our lives we call ourselves simply us our chosen poets philosophers painters musicians even the great actors of the past those ardent spirits in whom genius was unquenchable by death men and women whose minds were fire and the corporal existence of no account in the forces of their being those who have lived by the spirit and not by the flesh all these are of our company these are the influencing souls who are our companions in the silence and seclusion of our lives not by the trumpery expedient of an alphabet wrapped upon a table or by the writing of an unguided pencil but by the communion of spirit with spirit we feel those other minds in converse with our own they teach they exhort they uplift us to their spirit world sometimes in hours of meditation and sometimes in the closer communion of dreams are their voices heard do they speak to you vera asked deeply moved her own voice trembling a little only in dreams speech is material and belongs to the earthly machine it is not from lip to ear but from mind to mind that the message comes and do they appear to you do you see them as they were on earth vera asked the november twilight had filled the room with shadow and the face of the spiritualist the sharply cut features and hollow cheeks and luminous gray-green eyes looked like the face of a ghost only in dreams is it given to us to look upon the disembodied great we feel and we know that is enough but in some rare cases where the earthly vesture has worn to its thinnest tissue where death has set its seat upon the living to one so divested of mortal attributes so marked for the spirit world the vision may be granted such an one may see you have known faltered vera yes i knew such a case in the final hour of an ebbing life the chain of wedded love that death had broken was reunited and the wife died with her last long gaze turned to the vision of her husband her last word was reunited 
vera was strangely impressed it was not easy for the unbelieving to make a mock of mr simeon's creed the force of his convictions the ideas that he had cultivated and brooded upon for the larger part of his life had so possessed the man that even scoffers were sometimes moved by his absolute sincerity and found themselves as it were unawares treating his theories almost seriously for vera in whom imagination was the greater part of mind there was no inclination to scoff but rather a most earnest desire that the spiritualist's creed might be justified by her own experience that it might be granted to her to sit in the melancholy solitude of that room with a volume of browning on her lap and to feel that the poet was near her that an invisible spirit was breathing enlightenment into her mind as she read the dying words of the beloved apostle in a death in the desert which had been to her as a new gospel and to know that when she raised her eyes to the portrait on the wall it was not dead but the living upon whom she looked this was involved in the creed of her church the communion of saints were not the gifted who had lived free from all the grossness of clay from the taint of earthly sin were they to be numbered among the saints and like them gifted with perpetual life perpetual fellowship with the faithful who adored them when he left the great silent house mr simeon knew that he had made a proselyte though vera had said little it was impossible to mistake the fervour with which she had welcomed his revelation of the spirit world here was a mind in want of new interests a heart yearning for something that the world could not give she sat by the dying fire in the gathering darkness long after her visitor had left her yes this had been her need of late something to think of something to wish for her life so overfull of the things that women desire pomp and luxury troops of friends jewels and fine clothes the too much that money always brings with it had vacant spaces and hours of vague depression in which the sense of loneliness became an aching pain End of chapter five chapter six of beyond these voices this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org reading by matt Perard. beyond these voices by mary elizabeth braddon chapter six mario provana's wife was the fashion the prestige for which some women strive and labor for years spending themselves and their husbands fortunes in the strenuous endeavor and having to confess themselves failures at last had been won by vera without an effort her husband's wealth had done much her youth and the something rare and exceptional in her beauty had done more but the disbrows had done the most of all with such material a triple millionaire's wife in the first bloom of her loveliness the work had been easy but no one could deny that the disbrows had worked and might fairly congratulate themselves as well as their fair young cousin first second or third as the case might be upon the result of their tactful efforts all disbrows were supposed to have tact just as they had arched insteps and long lean hands it was as much a mark of their race from the day of vera's return from her long italian honeymoon she found herself walled round and protected by her mother's kindred they came from all the points of the compass lord oakhampton from his park in north devon lady balgory from her castle in aberdeenshire lady hellstone from the land's end they came unbidden and overflowing with affection but much too tactful to be vulgarly demonstrative poor lady felicia's foolish pride kept us all at a distance they told vera but now that you are emancipated and your own mistress i hope you will let us be useful from countesses down to hard-up spinsters they all said the same thing and no one could 
accuse them of gush they all announced themselves as worldlings pure and simple and they made no professions you have made a great match my dear said lady hellstone and you have a great career before you if you are careful in the choice of your friends that is the essential point one black sheep among your flock might spoil all your chances there are men about town that my husband calls oilers they were called tigers when my mother was young and one of those in a new woman's visiting list can wreck her the creatures are intolerably pushing and don't resist till they can pose as cavalier servante or at least as l'ami de la maison vera welcomed this army of blood relations with amiability but without enthusiasm she was ready to love that one kind lady who had given her the only happy holiday of her childhood under whose hospitable roof she had known claude rutherford but the countesses who had been unaware of her existence while she was a dependent upon poor lady felicia could have no claim upon her affection yet they and their belongings were all pleasant people and in that large and splendid house which was to be her home in london she found that people were wanted the emptiness of those spacious rooms during the long hours when her husband was at his offices in the city soon became appalling and she was glad of the lively aunts and cousins and their following who transformed her drawing-rooms into a parrot-house both for noise and brilliant colour to say nothing of the aquiline beaks that prevailed among the dowagers and elderly bachelors once established as her relations the distance of some of the cousinship being ignored they came as often as vera cared to ask them and they brought all the people whom vera ought to know the poets and novelists and playwrights who were all dying to know the daughter of lancelot davis that delightful poet whom everybody loved and nobody envied his fame had increased since he had gone into the ground and his shade was now crowned with that belated fame which is the aureola of the dead they brought the newest painting people and the fashionable actors and actresses english or american as well as that useful following of nice boys who are as necessary in every drawing-room as occasional chairs or tables to hold teacups instigated by the disbrows and with mario provana's approval vera soon began that grand business of entertaining to which a triple millionaire's wife should indubitably devote the greater part of her time talent and energy countesses and countess dowagers gave their mornings to her advising whom she should invite and how she should entertain they instructed her in the table of precedence as solemnly as if it had been the church catechism showing her how in some rare concatenation a rule might be broken as a past master of harmony might on occasion allow himself the use of consecutive fifths they were never tired of extending madame provana's knowledge of life as it is lived in the london that is bounded on the south by queen anne's gate and by portland place on the north they called it opening her mind and praised her for the intelligence with which she mastered the social problems her husband was pleased to see her admired and cherished above all to see her happy yet he could not but feel some touch of disappointment when he looked back upon those quiet afternoons in the olive woods at san marco and the tea-parties of three in lady felicia's sitting-room and remembered how he had thought he was marrying a friendless and unappreciated girl who would be all the world to him and for whom he must be all the world and a long future of wedded love he thought he was marrying a friendless orphan whose divine inheritance was poetry and beauty and he found that he had married the desbrows they were all terribly friendly they never hinted at his inferior social status his vulgar level as a tradesman only trading in money instead of goods they behaved as if by marrying their cousin he had become a desbrow lady helstone lady balgory lord and lady oakhampton treated him with affection without arrière-pensée 
the most that okehampton as a man of the world wanted from the great financier was his advice about the investment of his paltry surplus so trifling an amount that he blushed to allude to the desire in such exalted company but now a time had come when vera needed no counsel from the disbrows and when she was beginning to treat those social obligations about which she as a tyro had laboured diligently with a royal carelessness her aunts complained that she had grown casual and that she had even gone very near offending some of their particular friends people whom to have on her visiting list ought to have been the crown of her life vera apologized i know far too many people she said my house is becoming a caravansary she said my house unconsciously with a deep-seated knowledge that all those splendid rooms and the splendid crowds that filled them meant very little in her husband's life six years of the too much had changed lady felicia's granddaughter the things that money can buy had ceased to charm the people whom in her first season she had thought it a privilege to know had sunk into the dismal category of bores almost all almost everybody was a bore except a few men of letters who had known her father or who loved his verses for those she had always a welcome and she was proud when they told her that she was her father's daughter her eyes her voice were his these enthusiasts told her she was a creature of fire and light as he was after three or four years of pleasure in trivial things she had grown disdainful of all delights except those of the mind and the imagination the opera or the theatre when shakespeare was acted always charmed her but for the olipodrida of music and nonsense that most people cared for she had nothing but scorn she never missed a fine concert or a picture show but she broke half her engagements to evening parties or appeared for a quarter of an hour and vanished before her hostess had time to introduce the new arrivals american or continental who were dying to know her the general impression was that she gave herself airs but they were airs that harmonized with her fragile beauty the something ethereal that distinguished her from other women if any stout florid creature were to behave like madame provana she would be cut dead people told vera's familiar friend lady susan amphlett lady susan pleaded her friend's frail constitution as an excuse for casual behaviour she is all nerves and suffers agonies from ennui her father was consumptive and her mother was a fragile creature who faded away after three years of a happy married life it was a marriage of romance and beauty davis and his wife were both lovely but they had no stamina vera has no stamina lady felicia had been lying more than a year in the family vault in warwickshire her last years had been the most prosperous and comfortable years of her life and the vision of the future that had smiled upon her in the golden light above the jutting cliff of bordighera had been amply realized by the unmeasured liberality of her granddaughter's husband before vera's honeymoon was over the shabby lodgings in the dull unlovely street had been exchanged for a spacious flat in a red brick skyscraper overlooking regent's park large windows lofty ceilings a southern aspect and the very newest note in decoration and upholstery had replaced the sunless drawing-room and the philistine walnut furniture and for those last years the disbrow clan ceased to talk of captain cunningham's widow as poor lady felicia what more could any woman want of wealth than to be able to draw upon the purse of a triple millionaire as everything in lady felicia's former surroundings her shifting camp of nearly twenty years had been marked with the broad arrow of poverty every detail of this richly feathered nest of her old age bore the stamp of riches and the disbrows who knew the price of things could see that mario provana had treated his wife's relation with princely generosity once more lady felicia's diamonds those last relics of her youth to which she had held through all her necessitous years were to be met in the houses of the fashionable and the great and lady felicia herself 
in a sumptuous velvet gown silvery hair dressed by a fashionable artist emerged from retirement in a perfect state of preservation having the advantage by a decade of giddy dowagers who had never missed a season the giddy dowagers looked at her through their face main and laughed about lady felicia's resurrection she looks as if she had been kept in cotton wool and put to bed at ten o'clock every night they said granny enjoyed that indian summer of her life and was grateful you have married a prince she told vera and if you ever slight him or behave badly you will deserve to come to a bad end vera protested that she knew her husband's value and was not ungrateful i want to make him happy she said that is easy enough retorted granny you have only to love him as he deserves to be loved was that so easy vera wondered sadly it seemed to her that by no fault of hers there had come a difference in her relations with her husband he was always kind to her but he was farther from her than in the first year the italian year which to look back upon was still the happiest of her married life he was absorbed in a business that needed strenuous labor and unflagging care he had told her that it was not his own interests alone that he had to guard but the interests of other people there were thousands of helpless people who would suffer by his loss of fortune or his loss of prestige the pinnacle upon which the house of Provana stood was the strong rock of a multitude a certain anxiety was therefore inevitable throughout his business life he could never be the holiday husband sharing all a wife's trivial pleasures interested in all the nothings that make the sum of an idle woman's existence vera accepted the inevitable and it was only when she began to think the best people rather boring that she discovered how the distance had widened between herself and her husband without a dissentient word without a single angry look they had come to be one of those essentially modern couples whose loveless unions father cyprian deplored she thought the blame was with mario provana he had ceased to care for her just as she had grown weary of her troops of friends her husband had wearied of the wife he had chosen after a week's courtship he thought he was in love but he could not really have cared for me she told herself his heart was empty and desolate after the loss of his daughter and he took me because i was young and had been julia's friend this was how vera reasoned sitting in her lonely sanctuary while on the other side of the wall there was a man of mature age a man with a proud temper and a passionate heart a man who had endured slights in his youth whose first marriage had ended in disappointment the crushing discovery that the beautiful girl who had been given to him by a noble and needy father had sacrificed her inclinations for the sake of her family and had never loved him she had been faithful and she had endured his love that was all and in those last years when disease had laid a withering hand upon her beauty and when the world seemed far off and when only her husband's love stood between her and death she had learnt the value of a good man's devotion and had loved him a little in return he had suffered the disillusions of that first union yet again after many years he had staked his happiness upon a single chance and had taken a girl of eighteen to his heart in a state of exultation that was more like a dream than sober reality he had lavished upon this unsophisticated girl all the force of strong feelings long held in check at last at last in the maturity of manhood the love that had been denied to his youth was being given to him in full measure he could not doubt that she loved him that innocent unconscious love trusting as the love of children revealed itself in tones and looks that he could not mistake before he asked her to be his wife he was sure that she loved him but after six years of marriage he was no longer sure of anything except that his wife was the fashion and that her disbrow relations were innumerable he was sure of nothing about this girl whom he had clasped to his breast in a rapture of triumphant love on the hill above the mediterranean 
year after year of their married life had carried her farther away from him who could say precisely what made the separation he only knew that the years which should have tightened the bond had loosened it and that he could no longer recognize his child wife of their roman honeymoon in the fragile inalli whom society had chosen to adore End of chapter six chapter nine of beyond these voices this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org reading by matt Berard. beyond these voices by mary elizabeth braddon chapter seven well now your whim has been gratified i should like to know what you think of francis simeon claude rutherford asked as he put down his hat in vera's sanctum the day after her conference with the high priest of occultism the question was his only greeting he had slipped into the low and spacious chair by the hearth and seemed to lose himself in it while he waited for a reply he had the air of being perfectly at home in the room with no idea that he could possibly be unwelcome he came and went in madame provana's house with a lazy insouciance that many people would have taken for indifference only the skilled reader of men would have detected the hidden fire under that outward serenity of the attractive man who flirts with any attractive woman of his acquaintance and cares for none i think he is wonderful and you believe in him yes i believe in him because his ideas only give form and substance to the thoughts that have haunted me ever since i began to think grisly thoughts no claude happy thoughts when i first read my father's poetry and began to think about him in my dull grey room in granny's lodgings i had a feeling that he was near me he was there but behind the veil when i read in memoriam the feeling grew stronger and i knew that death is not the end of love there was nothing that shocked or startled me in what mr simeon told me yesterday about us the spiritual club in which the dead and the living are members on the same footing the club that elects or selects confucius or browning one day and lady fanny ransom mad lady fanny as they call her the next i saw nothing to ridicule in a companionship of lofty minds but you know more about the society than i do perhaps you are a member claude answered first with a light gay laugh and then in his most languid voice not i i am of the earth earthy sensual sinful if i went to one of their meetings i should have to go disguised as a poodle lady fanny owns a fine russian that has a look of mephisto though i believe he is purely canine tell me all you know about their meetings imagine a quaker's meeting with the female members in parisian frocks and hats a large room at the back of simeon's chambers in the albany it was once a fashionable editor's library smelling of russia leather and gay with zandor's bindings but it is now the abode of a shadow where glowing embers through the room teach light to counterfeit a gloom and there the congregation sits in melancholy silence till somebody lady fanny or another begins to say things that have been borne in upon her from shakespeare or browning or marlowe or schopenhauer or her favourite bishop if she is pious they wait for inspiration as the quakers do i am told lady f is tremendous she is strong upon politics and is frankly socialistic she has communications from karl marx and fourier george eliot and comte her inspiration takes the widest range and moves her to the wildest speech but she is greatly admired they never have a blank day when she is there i should like to hear her i know she is eccentric but she is immensely clever and she seems to have read everything worth reading in half a dozen languages she crams her expansive brain with the best books but i am told she occasionally puts them in upside down 
and the author's views came out topsy-turvy you are of imagination all compact vera but i should be sorry to see you lapsing into fannytude you scoff at everything there is nothing serious for you in this world or the next which next world there are so many simians for instance and father hammond's what could be more diverse than those i have thought very little about the undiscovered country but you must not say i am not serious about something in this world i cannot imagine what that something is i hope you will never know in fact you are never to know his earnestness startled her and when a man's dominant note is persiflage any touch of grave feeling is impressive vera was silent and they sat opposite each other for a few moments she watching the rise and fall of a blue flame in the heap of logs he watching her face as the blue light flashed upon it for an instant and then left it dark it was a face worth watching she had her mermaid look this evening and her eyes ordinarily dark gray looked as green as her sea-water necklace how is provana he asked at last an automatic question indicating faintest interest in the answer oh he is very well but i am afraid he is worried he stays longer in the city than he used to stay and he is very grave and silent when we dine alone what would you do if the great house of provana were to go down like a scuttle ship would you stick to a bankrupt husband renounce london and all its pomps and vanities give up this wilderness of a house and all the splendid things in it can you suppose the loss of money would change my feeling for him if you can think that you must think i married him because he was rich and didn't you i hate you for the question when mario asked me to be his wife i had not a thought of his wealth i knew that he was a good man and i was proud of his love but you were not in love with him i don't know what you mean i loved him for his noble character i was proud of his love that is not being in love vera a woman who is in love does not care a jot for her lover's character she loves him all the better perhaps because he is a scoundrel the last of the last the off scouring there were women in rome who doted upon caesar borgia women who knew that he was a poisoner take my word for it you liked provana because he was your first lover and you were tired of a year in year out tete -tete with granny you know nothing about it if he were to lose his fortune to-morrow i think i should be rather glad we could live in italy poverty would bring us nearer together as we were in our honeymoon year we should have plenty to live upon with my settlement she rose and moved towards the door it is nearly five and there will be people coming she said the door opened as she spoke and lady susan amphlett looked in aren't you coming vera there is a mob already and people want their tea what are you two talking about entre chien et loup you look as weird as mr simeon claude we were talking of simeon when vera began to worry about the people downstairs who are not half so interesting i should think not mr simeon is thrilling to know him is like what it must have been to be intimate with simon foreman or dr d i would give worlds to belong to his society it is quite the smart thing to do the members give themselves no end of airs in a quiet way lady susan would have stood in the doorway talking in her crisp and rapid way for a quarter of an hour oblivious of the people in the drawing-room but vera slipped a hand through her arm and they went downstairs together susan talking all the way fanny ransom has just come in with her girl not out yet but ages old and knowing what she ought to know how can a woman like fanny eaten up with spiritualism look after a daughter they say she went to paris last winter on purpose to attend a black mass the not out daughter asked claude no the mother but she told the girl all about it and the minx raves about the devil and says she would rather be initiated than presented next year lady fanny had better take care or she will be expelled from us 
i don't think simeon would approve of the black mass his philosophy is all light light and darkness are his good and evil claude spoke in an undertone as they were in the room by this time but he ran small risk of being overheard in a place where everybody seemed to be talking and nobody listening lady fanny was the centre of a group her large brown eyes flashing her voice the loudest a tall commanding figure in a black and gold gown and a black beaver hat with long ostrich feathers and a diamond buckle a hat that suggested rupert of the rhine rather than a modern matron her girl stood a little way off with three other not outs listening to her mother's balderdash with unsuppressed mockery isn't she too killing this dutiful child exclaimed in a rapture of contemptuous amusement and then she and her satellites bounced down upon the most luxurious ottoman within reach and employed themselves in disparaging criticism of the company generally their dress demeanour and social status with much whispering and giggling happily unobserved by grown-ups who all had their own interesting subjects to talk about lady fanny was deserted in favour of vera who at the tea-table became the focus of everybody's attention at the beginning she had taken a childish pleasure in pouring out tea for her friends rejoicing in the exquisite china the old-world silver glittering in the blue light of the spirit lamps the flowers and the beauteous surroundings so different from the scanty treasures of shabby gentility the dented silver worn thin with long use the relics of a swansea tea service with many a crack and rivet to which her youth had been restricted she performed the office automatically nowadays oppressed with the languor that hangs over those who are tired of everything most especially the luxury and beauty they once longed for one can understand that in the reign of our hanoverian kings it was just the state of mind which made the wits and beauties eager for a window over against newgate to see a row of murdering pirates hanging against the morning sky nothing could be too ghastly or grim for exhausted souls in want of sensation the afternoon droppers in had long become a weariness to madame provana yet as her fashion had depended much upon her accessibility she could not have shut her door upon people who considered themselves obliging when they used her drawing-room as a rather superior club claude rutherford slipped out of the room imperceptibly eluding the people who wanted to talk to him with the agility of a vanishing harlequin he had another visit to pay before his evening engagements an almost daily visit there was just one person in the world for whom he who had left off caring for people or things was known to care very much in expatiating upon the blemishes in an agreeable young man's character people often concluded with but he is a model son he adores that old woman in palace place it was to the old woman in palace place that claude was going this november afternoon and walking briskly through the clear cold gray he knew as well what the old woman was doing as if he had been gifted with second sight she was sitting in her large low chair with her table and exquisite little tea service his gift at her elbow and with her eyes fixed on the dial of the several clock on the mantelpiece while her heart beat in time to the ticking of the seconds and he knew that if he were but ten minutes later than usual those minutes were long enough for the maternal mind to visualize every form of accident that can happen to a young man about town nobody talked of poor mrs rutherford or pitied her widowed solitude as they had pitied lady felicia the fact that she had her own house in a fashionable quarter and a handsome income made all the difference the house was not spacious but it was old and adam's house and one of the prettiest in london for whatever had been done to it after adam's had been done with taste and discretion much of the furniture was of the same date as the house and all that was more recent was precious after its kind and had been bought when precious things were easier to buy than they are now and mrs rutherford was as perfect as her surroundings a slim pale woman 
dressed in black and wearing the same widow's cap which she had put on in sorrow and anguish fifteen years before and which harmonized well with the long oval face and banded brown hair lightly streaked with grey she was a quiet person and entertained few visitors except those of her own blood or connections by marriage but the name of those being legion nobody called her inhospitable altogether she was a mother whom no well-bred son need be ashamed of loving once upon his friend saying something to this effect claude had turned upon the man fiercely i should have loved her as well if she had been a beggar in the streets and had hung about the doors of public houses with me in her arms to me she is not mrs rutherford but just the sweetest tenderest mother on this earth and she would have been the same if fate had made her a beggar you believe that in your fantastic fits but you know it ain't true said his friend mrs rutherford looked up with a radiant face when her son entered the room she had heard his light step on the stair he had a latch-key and there was no other sound to announce his coming am i late mother it is eight minutes past five and you have been watching the clock instead of taking your tea the butler entered with a teapot as he spoke having made the tea immediately upon hearing the hall door open what have you been doing with yourself this afternoon dearest mrs rutherford asked looking up at him fondly as he stood with his back to the mantelpiece looking down at her loafing as usual i looked in at the new gallery their winter show began to-day half a dozen grand things the rest croupet and then she asked gently seeming sure there would be something else then i walked up regent street it was a fine bracing afternoon from the gallery to the langham and along portland place and you had tea with vera provana no not tea there is no tea worth tasting out of this room there was a mob as usual at the Provanas, and I slipped away. Was Signor Provana there? Not he. He was last heard of in Vienna, but I believe he is coming home next week. An unsatisfactory husband for a young thing like Vera, said Mrs. Rutherford, with a faint cloud in her thoughtful face. Claude knew that look of vague trouble. It was often on his mother's forehead when she spoke of Vera. I don't think women ought to call him unsatisfactory. He is the most indulgent husband I know. He adores his wife, and she reigns like a queen in that great house of his, and in the Roman villa. That kind of indulgence is a dangerous thing for a young woman, especially if she is capricious and full of strange fancies. Poor little Vera, you don't seem to have a high opinion of her. I don't want to be unkind. She has passed through an ordeal that only a woman of high principles and strong brain can pass without deterioration a girlhood of poverty and deprivation under close surveillance and a married life of inordinate luxury and liberty she was married at eighteen remember claude before her character could be formed nor was lady felicia the person to lay the foundation of a fine character one ought not to speak ill of the dead but poor felicia was sadly trivial and worldly minded madre mia what a sermon if you think poor little vera is in danger why don't you contrive to see a little more of her she would love to have you for a real friend she has a host of acquaintances but not too many friends susan amphlett is devoted to her but lady susie is not a tower of strength i believe they suit each other they are both feather-headed and both poseuses. at this claude fired and was almost fierce vera is no poseuse he said she is utterly without self-consciousness i don't think she knows that she is lovely in spite of the society papers fortunately she has no time to read them she is too absorbed in her poets browning shakespeare dante i doubt if she reads a page of prose in a day and is not that a pose her idea is to be different from other women a creature of the imagination in the world but not of it that is what people say of madame provana so charming so different she can't help what people say any more than she can help looking more like undine than a woman whose clothes come from the rue de la paix mrs rutherford let the subject 
drop she did not want to bring unhappiness into the sweetest hour of her life the hour her son gave her and she knew she could not talk of vera without the risk of unhappiness he who was the joy of her life was also the cause of much sorrow but from the day he left the army under some kind of cloud never fully understood but divined by his mother she had never let him know what a disappointment his broken career had been to her she was a soldier's daughter and a soldier's widow and to be distinguished as a leader of men was to her mind almost the only way to greatness yet she had smiled when this cherished son had made light of military fame and told her he would rather be another Millet than another arthur wellesley she had expressed no regret a few years later when he told her that art was of all professions the most hateful and that he did not mean to follow up the flashy success of his early pictures they might make me an associate next year if my work was a little better he told her but i am not good enough to hit the public taste two years running it was the subject or the devilry in my picture that caught on i might never catch on again and i'm sick of it all the critics the dealers and the whole brotherhood of art there again his road in life came to a dead stop but this time it was not a wicked woman's form that barred the vista and shut out the temple of fame as he had missed being a great soldier he was to miss being a famous painter though the men who knew the men who had already arrived had told his mother that a brilliant career might have been his if he had chosen to work for it to work not by fits and starts like a fine gentleman in a picturesque painting-room but as reynolds had worked and etty and wilkie when he sat on the floor painting with his own legs for his subject again after trying her powers of persuasion and trying to fire his ambition mrs rutherford had resigned herself to disappointment and had been neither reproachful nor lugubrious she was an ambitious woman and her son had disappointed her ambition she was a deeply religious woman and she saw her son indifferent to his religion if not an unbeliever and she never persecuted him with tears or remonstrances only on rare occasions and with the utmost delicacy pleading the urgency of a strong faith in the midst of a faithless generation and the deadly risk the man runs who neglects the sacraments of his church although she did not often approach the subject in her talk with claude it was not the less a subject of anxious thought and she replied upon the influence of her old and devoted friend father cyprian hammond rather than her own for the saving of her son's soul if a good woman's prayers could have guarded his path and kept him from temptation claude rutherford would have walked between guardian angels End of chapter seven chapter eight of beyond these voices this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sarah in Brighton. Beyond These Voices by Mary Elizabeth Braddon. Chapter 8, Part 1. While Claude Rutherford's peril was a subject of troubled thought for his mother and her friend and father confessor, Cyprian Hammond, no friendly voice had breathed words of warning into Vera's ear, nor had she any consciousness that warning was needed or that danger threatened. Claude was part of her life from the day when she had met him for the first time after her marriage at a luncheon party at Lady Oakhampton's, and they too had sat talking in the embrasure of a window, recalling delicious memories of her childhood's once happy holiday the ponies the dogs the gardens the woods the beach and sea all the joy of his kindness had created for her in that verdant paradise upon that summer sea from that happy hour when they had sat talking 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 while lady oakhampton waited with growing displeasure for an unpunctual dowager duchess she had felt that this kinsman of hers belonged to her 
that to him she might look as the guide, philosopher, and friend, indispensable to the happiness of every woman whose husband is occupied with serious interests and has a mind above trivialities. There was nothing too trivial for Claude to understand and discuss with interest. The merest nothing would command his serious thought. If it were something that interested Vera, nor was any flight of her fancy too wild or too high for him, from the colour of a frock or the shape of a hat to the most oracular utterance of Zarathustra, she could command his attention and counsel. He came and went in her house like the idle wind, and his entrances and exits were no more considered than the wind. When her particular friends asked her whether she had seen Mr. Rutherford lately, she would shrug her shoulders and smile. My cousin Claude? Yes, he was here yesterday. I see him almost every day. If he has nothing better to do, he comes in after his morning ride and sometimes stays for luncheon. People were not unkind, but as years went on, the situation was taken for granted, and there were quiet smiles, gently significant, when Madame Provana and her cousin were talked about. Their relations were accepted as one of those open secrets, not to know which is not to be in society. Lady Susan did her best to establish the scandal by telling people that Vera and Claude had been brought up together, or almost, and that their attachment was the most innocent and prettiest thing imaginable, like Paul and Virginia, a classic which, which Lady Susan had never read. The almost was necessary, as most people knew that Vera had been brought up by Lady Felicia in furnished lodgings and had hardly had a second frock to her back to say nothing of being underfed, which early privation was the cause of the pale slenderness that some people called ethereal. Lady Susan's friends, furthermore, being well up in Burke, were satirical about the link of kindred between third and fifth cousins. Yet on the whole there was indulgence, and when Vera went on a week-end visit to the seats of the mighty, she generally found Mr. Rutherford one of the party, which was hardly a cause for wonder, since he was of the stuff of which weekend parties are made. Vera was more than innocent. She was unconscious of anything particular in her friendship for his friend of, ch of her childhood. What could be more natural than that she should love to talk of that one blissful interval in her dull existence, the solitary oasis in the desert of genteel poverty? Only then had she known the beauty of woods and gardens. Only then had she known what summer could mean to the emancipated child, the rapture of riding over dancing waves in a cockleshell of a boat, with the warm wind blowing her hair and the seagulls flashing their white wings overhead, the adorable birds whose name was Legion. To talk of those young days and to feel again as she had felt then was a delight which only Claude could give her and the more hollow and unsatisfying things that money could buy became to her, the more she loved to sit with her locked hands upon her knee and talk of that unforgotten holiday. Do you remember that evening I asked you to row me out to the setting sun, right into the great golden ball, and you said you would, and you went too far, and we were out till after dark, and everybody was frightened and then angry. All their talk began with, do you remember? His memory was better than hers, and he recalled adventures and moments that she had forgotten. One day he brought her a little sketch on thick cardboard, roughly painted in oils, one of his early bits of impressionism before he had studied art, a little girl in a short white frock, with hair flying about her, cheeks like roses, and the blue of the sea in her eyes. What a funny child! You didn't mean that for me, for no one else. I have dozens of such daubs. You remember how I used to sit on a rock and paint while you were looking for shells or worrying the jellyfish? Poor things. I wanted to see them move. I hope they had no feelings. Yes, you used to sit and paint, and I thought you disagreeable because you would not play with me. Beyond these pictures of the past, they had inexhaustible subjects for talk. There was a whole world of literature, the literature of decadence in which Vera had to be initiated, and Claude was a past master in that particular phase of intellectual life. Baudelaire, Verlaine, Nietzsche, the literature of pessimism and the literature of despair, 
that rebellion against law, human and divine, which Shelley began and which had been a dominant note among young poets since the revolt of Islam, filled romantic minds with wonder and a vague delight. Imperceptibly, naturally, and in no manner wrongfully, as it seemed to Vera, Claude Rutherford's society had become essential to her happiness. She accepted the fact as placidly and with as complete confidence in him and in herself as if such a friendship between an idle young man and an imaginative young woman had never been known to end in shame and sorrow. She had lived in the world half a dozen years and had known of many social tragedies, but as these had not touched any friends she valued and as she was not a scandal lover, those dark stories of husbands betrayed and nurseries abandoned had never deeply impressed her and had been speedily forgotten. Nobody, not even Lady Susie, who was a mauvais longue, had ever hinted at impropriety in her association with her cousin. Signor Pravana saw him come and go and asked no questions. That stern and lofty nature was of the kind that is not jealous. Had there been no Iago, Cassio might have come and gone freely in the noble Moor's household, and no shadow of fear would have darkened that great love. Vera's husband was a disappointed man. His dream of a young and loving wife who would make up to him for all that he had missed in boyhood and youth had melted into thin air. He was sensitive and proud, and the memory of his unloved childhood and of his first wife's indifference was never absent from his mind when he considered his relations with his second wife. He thought of his age, he saw his stern, rough features in the glass, and a faint touch of coldness, the fretful weariness of an overindulged girl, was taken for aversion, and all his pride and all his force of character rose up against the creature he loved too well to judge wisely. It was he who built the wall that parted them. It was his gloomy distrust of himself rather than of Vera that made the gulf between them. Let her be happy in her own way. He had sworn to make her happy, and if it was her nature to delight in trivial things, if the aimless existence of a rich man's sultana was her idea of bliss, she would reign sole mistress of a harem, which he never would enter while he believed himself unwelcome there. Vera accepted this gradual drifting apart as something inevitable for which she was not to blame. The strong man's impassioned love, which had appealed to the romantic side of her character, had languished and died with the passing years. She brooded on the change with sorrowful wonder before she became accustomed to the idea that the lover who had taken her to his heart with a cry of ineffable rapture had ceased to exist in the grave man of business, whose preoccupied manner and absent gaze, as of one looking at things far away, chilled her when she sat opposite him on those rare occasions when they dined tete-a-tete. -tete. Occasions when the dinner-table was only a glittering spot in the dark spaciousness of the room, a world of shadows, where the footmen moved like ghosts in the area between the table and the far-off sideboard. They had been married six years, but Vera thought sadly that her husband looked twenty years older than the companion by whose side she had climbed the mule paths through the lemon orchards and olive woods of San Marco, the man whose conversation had always interested her, her first friend, her first lover. She accepted the change as inevitable, having been taught by the wives of her acquaintance to believe that marriage was the death of love and as gradual as she learned to dispense with her husband's society so guiltlessly, because unconsciously she came to depend upon Claude Rutherford for sympathy and companionship. She did not know that she loved him, though she knew that the day when they did not meet seemed a long, drawn-out weariness, and that when the evening shadows came, they brought a sense of desolation and a strange lassitude, as of one weighed down by intolerable burdens. All occupations and all amusements were burdens if Claude was not sharing them, society the heaviest of all, far easier to endure the dreary day in the solitude of her den, with the faces of her beloved dead looking at her, 
than among empty-headed people who could only talk of what other empty-headed people were doing or were going to do with that light spice of malice that makes other people's mistakes and misfortune so piquant and interesting. Claude Rutherford had become a part of her life, and life was meaningless without him, a fatal stage in the downhill path, but it was a long time before her awakened conscience gave the first note of warning. Then, waking in the first faint flush of a summer dawn, after a night of troubled sleep and feverish dreams, a night succeeding one of those dismal days that she had been obliged to endure without the sight of the familiar face, the glad, gay call of the familiar voice, the sound of the light footstep on the stairs, she told herself for the first time with unutterable horror that this man was dearer to her than he ought to be, dearer than her husband, dearer than her peace of mind, dearer than all this world had held for her and all the next world promised. Oh, the wickedness of it, the shame, the horror, to be false to him, the man who had put his strong arms round her and lifted her out of the dismal swamp of shabby gentility and taken her to, this gen to his generous heart, the man who trusted her with unquestioning faith, who had never by word or look betrayed the faintest doubt of her truth and purity. No lover's word had been spoken, no lover lover's lips had met, yet as she rose from that uneasy bed and paced the spacious room in fever and agitation, a ghostly figure with bare feet and streaming hair and long white draperies, she felt as if she were steeped to the lips in dishonour, a monster of ingratitude and treachery. And then she began the struggle that most women make, even the weaker souls, when they feel the downward path sloping under their feet and know that the pit of shame lies at the bottom of it. Though they cannot see it yet, the impotent struggle in which all the odds are against them, their environment, every circumstance of their lives, their friends, the nearest and dearest even, to whom they cannot cry aloud and say, Don't you see that I am fighting the tempter? Don't you see that I am halfway down the hill and I'm trying to make a stand, that I'm over the edge of the cliff and hanging to the bushes with bleeding, lacerated hands in the desperate endeavour to keep myself from falling? Have you neither eyes nor understanding that you don't try to help me? Rarely is any friendly hand stretched out to help the woman who sees her danger and tries to escape her doom. Acquaintances look on and smile. These open secrets are accepted as part of the scheme of the universe, a particular phase of existence that doesn't matter as long as the chief actors are happy. The wife, her familiar friend, her complacent or indifferent husband are smiled upon by a society of men and women who know their world and take it for what it is worth. Only when the actors begin to play their parts badly, when the open secret becomes an open scandal, does society cease to be kind. Vera did not think of society in that tragic hour of an, un of an awakened conscience. That which would have been the first thought, with most women, had no place in her mind. It was of her sin that she thought. The sin of inconstancy, of ingratitude, of faithlessness. Had she crossed the border line and qualified herself for the divorce court, she could not have thought of herself with deeper contrition. To love this other man better than she loved her husband, to long for his coming, to be happy when he was with her and miserable when he was away, there was the sin. But no word of love had been spoken. There was time for repentance. He did not know that she loved him, although looking back and recalling words and tones of his, she could not doubt that he loved her. She could hope that no word of hers had revealed the passion, whose development had been gradual and imperceptible as the growth of the leaf buds in early spring, which no eye marks till they flash into life in the first warmth of April. Her friendship with this man, who was her kindred, the companion of the only happy days of her childhood, had seemed as natural as it would have been to attach herself to a brother with whom she had long been separated. She had welcomed him with a childish eagerness. She had trusted him with a childish belief in the perfection of the creature who is kind. She had admired him, comparing him with all the other young men she knew, and finding him 
him infinitely above them. His very weakness had appealed to her. All that was wanting in his character made him more likable, since compassion and regret mingled with her liking. To be so clever, so gifted by nature, and to have done nothing with nature's gifts, to be doomed to go down to death, leaving his name written in waters, to die having finished nothing but his beau jour. People who liked him best talked to him as a young man with a beau passé. Shoulders were shrugged and smiles were sad when his painter friends discussed him. We thought he was going to do great things in art, and he has done nothing. Soldiers who remembered him before he left the army lamented the loss of a man who was made for a soldier. There had been trouble, trouble about a woman that had made him exchange to a line regiment. And then, the war being over and the chance of active service remote, disgust had, disgust had come upon him and he had done with soldiering. Vera had seen his shoulders shrugged, had heard the deprecating criticism of his kinsman affairs, and had been all the kinder to him because fate had been cruel. She had tried to fire him with new hope. She had been ambitious for him, had steeped herself in art books and spent her mornings in picture galleries, in order that she might be able to talk to him, she had implored him to go back to his work, to paint better pictures than he had painted when critics prophesied a future for his work. I'm too old, he said. Nonsense, you've wasted a few years, but you will have to work harder and buy back your lost time. Quentin Matisse did not begin to paint till he was older than you. There were giants in those days compared with such men I am an invertebrate pygmy. Oh, if you loved art, you would not be content to live without the joy of it. Yes, that's what people look at pictures think, the joy of painting, a thing like that. The man who paints knows when the disgust comes in and the joy goes out. He knows the sense of failure, the disappointment, the longing to fling his half-finished picture on the floor and perform the devil's dance upon it, as Muller used to do. And then one day, as they were going round a picture gallery together, he said, Well, Vera, I've been meditating on your lecture, and I'm going to paint another picture. The last, perhaps. No, it won't be the last. I'm going to paint your portrait. After all, that's sermonising. You can't refuse to sit to me. I won't refuse, unless Mario should object. How should he object? He will be in New York, or Madrid, or Constantinople, most likely while I am painting you. I am nothing, if not impressionist, so it mustn't be a long business. I shall love sitting to you, to see you at work. Yes, to see me earning my bread in the sweat of my brow like the day labourer will be a novelty. I shouldn't want to be paid for the picture, but I dare say Provana would insist upon my taking a fee, and as he counts in thousands, it would be a handsome one. No, Vera, don't blush. I won't take money for my daub. You should give it to the Canine Defence League. It shall be a labour of love, a concession to a sermonising cousin. I shall paint your portrait just to convince you that I can't paint and that the life I am wasting is worth nothing. Thus, in light talk and laughter, the plan was made that brought them into a closer intimacy than they had known before. And although Claude Rutherford was an impressionist, that portrait was three months upon the easel, which he had rigged up in Vera's morning room. I want to paint you in the room where you live, not with a marble pillar and a crimson curtain for a background. The sittings went on at irregular intervals, in a style that, that was at once sauntering and spasmodic. All through that season, Signor Gravana looked in now and then, stood watching the painter at work for five or ten minutes, criticised and made a sudden exit, driven away by Lady Susan's sh shrill chatter. But Lady Susan was not always there, and there were more tranquil hours when Vera sat in a half-reclining attitude on a low sofa spread with a tiger skin, fanning herself with a great fan of peacock feathers and gazing at the pictures on the wall with dreaming eyes, hours in which the painter and his subject talked by fits and starts with silent pauses. After all the pains that had been taken, the picture was a failure. The painter hated it. Pravana frankly disapproved and in the haggard, large-eyed, siren smiling over the edge of the fan, 
Vera could not recognise the face she saw in the glass. I've been much too long over the thing, Claude told Pavana, with slow and languid speech, half indifference, half disgust, and it is a dismal failure. But I shall do better next time, if Vera will let me make a rapid sketch of her, when the daffodils are in bloom and we shall be weekending at Marley Chase. I could make a picture of her on the hill above the house, in the yellow afternoon light and among the yellow flowers. I am an open-air painter, if I am anything, but I had almost forgotten how to set a palette. I shall work in a friend's studio in the autumn, and I may do better next year. Vera urged him to persevere in this good intention, and not to mind his failure. I mind nothing, he said. I have had three happy months. I mind nothing while you are kind, and forgive me for having put you to a lot of trouble with this atrocious daub for the outcome of it all. Privileged people only were allowed to see the daub, but those, although supposed to be few, in the end proved to be many. Critics were among them, and Mr Rutherford was too shrewd not to discover that every connoisseur had a little hole to pick in the portrait, and that when all the little holes were put together there was nothing left. And this picture, so poor a thing that it was as it was made, made the beginning of that open secret which everybody knew long before the awakening of Vera's conscience. And while Mario Pravana saw nothing to suspect or to fear in his wife's intimacy with her cousin. But now, with the awakening of conscience, began the fight against fate. The fight of the weak against the strong, the woman against the man, innocent youth against an experienced lover. She was single-hearted and pure in intention, counting happiness as thistledown against gold, when weighed against her honour as a wife. But she entered the list without knowing the strength of her opponent, the passive force of a weak man's selfishness. The main purpose of her life was henceforward to release herself from the web that had been woven so easily, so imperceptibly. First, a careless association between two people whose likings and ideas were in harmony, then friendship, confidence, sympathy, and then unavowed love, love that made the days desolate when the lovers were not together. He had been too frequent and too dear a companion. He had become the master of her life, and it was for her to release herself with that unholy bondage. She had to learn to live without him. It needed more than common cleverness and tact to bring about a change in their manner of life, without making a direct appeal to Rutherford's honour and telling him that their friendship had become a danger. To do this would be to tell him that she loved him, to confess her weakness before he had passed the borderline that divides the friend from the lover. No, she could make no appeal to the man whose smouldering fires she feared to kindle into flame. She knew that he loved her and that he had made her love him. She had to escape from the web that he had woven round her, and she had, if possible, to set herself free without his knowing the strength of her purpose or the desperate nature of the struggle. All the chances were against her. She could not forbid him in the house without an open scandal. As he had come and gone in the last four years, he must still be free to come and go. She could only avoid those familiar hours, hours that had been so dear, by living in a perpetual restlessness, always finding some engagement away from home. It was dreary work, but she persevered and enlisted all the disbros in her cause, unconscious that they were being made use of. She accepted every invitation, lent herself to every, everybody's fads, philanthropic or otherwise, listened to the same fiddlers and singers day after day, in drawing rooms and among people that she knew by heart, or stood with aching head under a ten-guinea hat, selling programmes at amateur theatricals. She contracted a closer alliance with the Lady Susan Amphlett, and planned excursions, a day at Windsor, a day at Dorking, at Guildford, to rummage in furniture shops at Greenwich, to see the Nelson relics, to Richmond and Hampton, even to Kew Gardens. Lady Susan was almost worn out by these simple pleasures, but as she professed and sincerely an absolute cult for Vera Pravana, she held out bravely. These excursions were fairly successful, and as Vera took care that no one should know where she and her friend were going, not even Susan until they were on the road, it was not possible for Claude to follow her. It was otherwise in the houses of her friends where she was always meeting him, and where it was essential that she should seem to avoid him, that she should not seem to avoid him, 
least of all to let him see she, she was doing so. She greeted him always with the old friendliness and a little more cousinly than it had been of late, and she showed a matronly interest in his health and occupations, as if she had been an aunt rather than a cousin. It is quite delightful to meet you here this afternoon, he told her, in a ducal house where guinea tickets for a charity concert seemed cheap to the outside public. You are to be met anywhere and everywhere except in your own house. I have called so often that I have taken a disgust for your knockers. When I am dead, I believe those lion's head will be found engraven on my heart like Queen Mary's Calais. It was only natural that, with the awakening of conscience, that there should come the thought of those two first years of a married life, when her husband's love had made an atmosphere of happiness around her, when she had cared for no other companion, needed no other friend, those blessed years before Claude Rutherford's pale, clear-cut face and low, seductive voice had become a part of her life, essential to her peace. The change of feeling, the growing regard for this man, had come about so gradually, with a growth so slow and, and imperceptible, that she tried in vain to analyse her feelings in those four years of careless intimacy, and to trace the process by which an innocent friendship had changed to a guilty love. When had the fatal change begun? She could not tell. It was only when she felt the misery of one long day of parting that she knew her sin. The husband had become a stranger. The friend had become the other half of her soul. He had called her by that sweet name sometimes, but was so playful a tone that the impassioned phrase had not scared her. It was one of many lightly spoken phrases that she had heard as carelessly as they was uttered. And now looking back at the last two years, she told herself that it was her husband's fault that she had lent on Claude for sympathy, her husband's fault that they, that they had been too much together. For some reason that she had never fathomed, Mario Bravano had held himself aloof from the old domestic intimacy. It was not only that his business engagements necessitated his absence from home several times in the course of the year, and on occasion for a considerable period. He had business in Russia and in Austria, and he had crossed the Atlantic twice in the last year. The affairs of his New York house calling for special attention in a disturbed state of American finance. These frequent absences alone were sufficient to weaken the marriage bond, but in the last year he had given his wife very little of society when they were under the same roof. You have hosts of friends, he said one day, when she was reproaching him for keeping aloof. People who share your tastes and can be amused by the things that amuse you. I bring back a tired brain after my continental journeys, and I'm still more tired after New York. I shall make a wretched companion for a young wife, a beautiful butterfly who was born to shine among all the other butterflies. I am nearly as tired as you are after your business journeys, Mario, she said. I shall be very glad when we go back to Rome. But you will have other butterflies there, and a good many of the same that flutter about you here, he answered. We will shut our doors upon them and live quietly, like Darby and Joan, old Darby and young Joan. No, Vera, we won't try that. You weren't made for the part. She had been too proud to say more. If he was tired of her, if he had ceased to care for her, she would not ask him why. But now, in her desperate need, sick to death of those aimless excursions and unamusing amusements with Lady Susan, and of the dire necessity of keeping away from her own house, to flutter from party to party, almost sure of meeting Claude wherever she went, she turned in her extremity to her natural protector and tried to find shelter in the love that ought to be her strong rock. End of chapter 8, part 1. Recording by Sarah in Brighton. Chapter 8 of Beyond These Voices. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sarah in Brighton. Beyond These Voices by Mary Elizabeth Braddon. Chapter 8, Part 2. Her husband had been on the continent. 
moving from city to city for the greater part of the June month, in which she had been making her poor little fight against fate, trying to cure herself of Claude Rutherford as if he had been at bad habit, like drink or drugs. And then one morning, when she was beginning the day dejectedly, tired of yesterday, hopeless of tomorrow, a telegram from Paris told her to expect her husband at seven o'clock that evening. Her heart beat gladly, as at the coming of a deliverer. She was not afraid of meeting him. She longed for his coming, as the one friend who might save her from an influence that she feared. The face she saw in the glass while her maid was dressing her hair almost startled her. There were dark marks under the eyes, and the cheeks were hollow and deadly pale. The black gauze dinner gown she had chosen would accentuate her pallor. But it was nearly seven o'clock, and there was no time for any change in her toilet. She paced the great empty rooms in sun and shadow, listening to every sound in the street, and wondering if her husband would see the sickening change that sickening thoughts had made in her face, and question her too closely. She heard the hall door open, and then the familiar footstep, rapid, strong, and yet light, very different from the footfall of a beast's middle age, the step of a man whose active life and energetic temperament had kept him young. She met him on the threshold of the drawing room. I'm so glad you've come home, she said, holding up her face for his kiss. He kissed her, but without enthusiasm. I am glad you are glad, he said, but can that mean that you've missed me? From your letters I thought you and Lady Susan were having rather a gay time. I was rushing about with her and going to parties, partly because I missed you, partly, and the other part of it was because you like parties and are dull at home, I suppose, unless you have your house full. Oh, I am sick of it all, Mario, she said with a sort of passionate energy that made him believe her. And I would live quite a different life if you were not away so often, and if I were not thrown too much on my own resources. My dear Vera, this is a new development, he said gravely, sitting down beside her and looking at her with eyes that troubled her, as if they could see too much of the mind behind her face. You are looking thin and white. Has anything happened while I've been away? Anything to make you unhappy? No, she exclaimed with tremendous emphasis, for she felt as if he were growing to rest, going to wrest her secret from her. What could happen? But I suppose there must come a time in every woman's life when she has had enough of what the world calls pleasure, when the charm goes out of amusements that repeat themselves year after year, and when one begins to understand the emptiness of a life occupied only with futilities, when one begins to tire of running after every new thing, actors, dancers, singers, and all the rest of them. I have had enough of that life, Mario, and I want you to help me to do something better with the liberty and the wealth you've given me. Do you want a mission? he asked with a faint smile. This is what women seem to want nowadays. No, Mario, I want to be happy with you. Your business engagements take you so much away from home that our lives must be sometimes divided, but not always. We need, we need not be always living a divided life, as we have been in the last three years. A crimson flush swept across her face as she spoke, remembering that these were the years in which Claude Rutherford's influence had grown from a careless comradeship to an absorbing intimacy. Her husband looked at her in silence for a few moments, and his grave smile had now a touch of irony. "'Has it dawned upon you at last?' he asked. Have you discovered that we have been living apart, that we have been man and wife in only name? It was not my fault, Mario. It was you who kept aloof. Not till I saw repulsion. Not till I saw aversion. No, no, never, never, never. I have never forgotten your goodness, never forgotten all I owe you. They had been sitting side by side on the spacious Louis Couture's sofa, his hand upon her shoulder, but at her last words he started to his feet with a cry of pain. Yes, that is it. You recognise an obligation. I have given you a fine house, fine clothes, fine friends, and you think you ought to repay me for them by pretending to love me. Vera, that is all over. There must be no more pretending. I can bear a good deal, but I cannot bear that. 
I told you something of my past life before we were married, but I doubt if I told you all its bitterness, all the blind egotism of my marriage, the cruel awakening from a dream of mutual love, to discover that my wife had married me because I could give her the things she wanted, and that love was out of the question. I compared myself with other men and saw the difference. And as I had missed the love of a mother, so I had to do without the love of a wife. I was not made to win a woman's love. No, not even a mother's. This was why my affection for my daughter was something more than the common love of fathers. She was the first who loved me, and she will be the last. Mario, you are too cruel. Have I not loved you? Yes, perhaps for a little while. You gave me a year of infinite happiness. Our honeymoon year. That ought to be enough. I have no right to ask for more, but let there be no talk of gratitude. If I cannot have love, I will have nothing. You have been so cold, so silent and reserved, so changed. I thought you were tired of me. Tired of you? Poor child. How should you know the measureless love in the heart of a man of my life history? When I took you in my arms in the evening sunshine, I gave you all that was best and strongest in my nature, boundless love and boundless trust. All my life history went for nothing in that hour. I did not ask myself if I was the kind of man to win the heart of a girl. I did not think of my five and forty years or my forbidding face. I gave myself up to that delicious dream. I had found a girl who could love me, the divine girl, youth and innocence incarnate. Think it, what it was after a year of happiness to be awakened by a look and to know that I had again been fooled. That if in the first surprise of my passionate love you'd almost love me, that love was dead. No, no, she sobbed. And then she hid her streaming eyes upon his breast and wound her arms about his neck, clinging to the husband in whom she found her only shelter. Was it some curious instinct of the flesh or some power of telepathy that told him not to take these tears and wild embrace for tokens of a wife's love? My dearest girl, he said with infinite gentleness, as he loosened the clinging arms and lifted the hidden face. If this distress means sorrow for having unwittingly deceived me, for having taken a man's heart and not been able to give him love for love, there need be no more tears. The fault was mine. The mistake was mine. You must not suffer for it. To me you will always be unspeakably sweet and dear, whether I think of you as a wife or as the girl my daughter loved, and whom I learned to love in those sad days when the shadow of death went with us in the spring sh sunshine. Yes, Vera, you will always be dear, my dearest on this earth, but there must be no pretending, nothing false. Think of me as your friend and protector, the one friend whom you can always trust, your rock of defence against all the dangers and delusions delusions of a wicked world. Trust me, dearest, and never keep a secret from me. Be true to yourself. Keep your honour stainless, your purity of mind unclouded by evil associations. Let no breath of calumny soil your name. Rise superior society chooses to ignore. I ask no more than this, my beloved girl, in return for measureless love and implicit faith. He was holding both her hands, looking at her with searching eyes, those clear grey eyes under a brow of power. Can you promise as much as this, Vera? Yes. With heart and mind? With heart and mind. And you will never take the liberty I give you for a letter of licence? No, no, no! But I don't ask for liberty. I want to belong to you, to be sheltered by you. You shall have the shelter, if you need it, but be true to yourself, and you will need no defender. A woman's safest armour is her own purity. And again, my love, with a return of the slightly ironical smile, never was a woman better guarded than you are while you are fringed around by Disbrows, protected at every point by your mother's clan, people at once well-born and well-bred, with no taint of bohemianism, unless indeed it may murk in your poco curante cousin. 
the young painter who made such a lamentable failure of your portrait. She felt as if every vestige of colour was fading out of her face, and that even her lips must be deadly white. They were so parched that when she tried to shape some trivial reply, the power of speech seemed gone. She felt the dry lips moving, but no sound came. This was the end of her appeal to the husband whose love might have saved her. Their relations were changed from that hour. He was not again the lover-husband of their honeymoon years, but he was no longer cold and reserved. He no longer held her at a distance. He was kind and sympathetic. He interested himself in her occupations and amusements, the books she read and the people she saw. He was with her at the opera, where Claude Rutherford sometimes came to them and sat through an act or two in the darkness at the back of the box. He was infinitely kind and tender, but it was the tenderness of a father or a benevolent uncle rather than of a husband. He held rigidly to that which he had told her. There was to be no make-believe in their relations. If she was not happy, she was at peace for some time after her husband's homecoming, a period in which they were more together than they had ever been since those first years in their married life. She tried to be happy, tried to forget the time in which Claude Rutherford had been her daily companion, the time when she planned no pleasure that he was not to share, and had no opinions about people or places or books or art that she did not take from him, loving the things he loved, hating the things he hated, as if they had been two bodies moved by one mind. She tried not to feel an aching void for want of him. She tried not to think him cruel for coming to her house so seldom, and tried to be so yeah! and tried to be sorry that they met so often in the houses of her friends. The time came when the awakened conscience was lulled to sleep, and when her husband's society began to jar upon her strained nerves. She had invoked him as a defence against the enemy, and now she longed for the enemy, and had ceased to be grateful to the defender. The rampart of defence was soon to fall. A financial crisis was threatened, and Signor Provana was wanted at his office in New York. He told his wife, that he might be able to come back to London in a fortnight, allowing ten days for the double passage and four for his business, but if things were troublesome in America he might be a good deal longer. I shall try to be home in time to take you to Marinbad, he told her, but if I'm not here, Lady O'Campton will take you, and you can get Lady Susan to go with you and keep you in good spirits. I had a talk with your aunt last night, and she promised to take you under her wing. I don't want to be under anybody's wing, and Aunt Mildred will bore me to death if I see much of her at Marinbad. Oh, you will have your favourite Susie for amusement, and your aunt to see that she doesn't lead you into mischief. Lady Susan is a shade too adventurous for my taste. This idea of Marinbad was a new thing. A certain nervous irritability had been growing upon Vera of late, and her husband had been puzzled and uneasy and had called in a nerve specialist recommended by Lady Oakhampton, one of those new lights whom everybody believe in for a few seasons. After a quiet talk with Vera that grave authority had suggested a rescue, the living death of six weeks in a nursing home, and on this being vehemently protest protested against by the patient, had offered Marinbad as an alternative. Pravana had been startled by this sudden change in his wife's temper, from extreme gentleness and an evident desire to please him, to a kind of febrile impatience and irritability, and remembering her curious agitation on the evening of his homecoming, her pallid cheeks and passionate tears, he had an uneasy feeling that these strange moods had a common source, and that there was something mysterious and unhappy that it was his business to discover before he left her. He came to her room early on the day of his departure, so early that she had only just left her bedroom, and was still wearing the loose white muslin gown in which she had breakfasted. She was sitting on her low sofa in a listless attitude, looking at the faces on the wall, Browning, Shelley, Byron, the faces of the inspired dead who were more alive than the uninspired living. But at her husband's entrance, she started to her feet and went to meet him. "'You are not going yet!' she exclaimed. 
I thought the boat train did not leave till the afternoon. It does not, but I must give the interval to business. I have come to bid you goodbye. I am very sorry you are obliged to go, she said. For God's sake, do not lie to me. For pity's sake, let there be no pretending. He took both her hands and drew her to him, looking at her with an imploring earnestness. I have trusted you as men seldom trust their wives, he said. I thought I had done you a great wrong when I took you in the first bloom of your beauty and made you my own, cutting you off forever from the love of a young lover and all the passion and romance of youth. Considering this, I tried to make amends by giving you perfect freedom, freedom to live your own life among your own friends, freedom for everything that could make a woman happy except that romantic love which you renounced when you accepted me as your husband. I believed in you, Vera. I believed in your truth and purity as I believe in God. I could never have reconciled myself to the life we have led in this house if it were not for my invincible faith in your truth. But within this month, that faith has been shaken. Your eyes have lost the old look, the lovely look through which truth shone like a light. There is something unhappy, something mysterious. There is a secret, and I must know that secret before I leave you. Her face changed to a look of stone as he watched her. It was no time for tears. It was time for a superhuman effort at repression, to hold every feeling in check, to make her nerves iron. There was defiance in her tone when she spoke after a silence that seemed long. There is no secret. Then why are you unhappy? I am not unhappy. I have a fit of low spirits now and then, a feeling of physical depression for which there is no reason, or perhaps my idle, useless life and the luxury in which I live may be the reason. It is something more than low spirits, you are nervous and irritable, and you have a frightened look sometimes, a look that frightens me. Oh, Vera, for God's sake be frank with me. Trust me half as much as I have trusted you. Trust me as a daughter might trust her father, knowing his measureless love, and knowing that with that love there would be measureless pity. Trust me, my beloved girl. Throw your burden upon me, and you shall find the strength of a man's love and the self-abnegation that goes with it. I have no secret, no mystery. I mean to be worthy of your trust. I mean to be true to myself. If you doubt me, let me go to America with you. Keep me with you. His face lighted as she spoke, and then he looked thoughtfully at the fragile form, the delicate features, the ethereal beauty that seemed to have so frail a hold on life. No, you are not the stuff for sea voyages, and the storm and stress of New York. If we went there together, I should have to leave you too much alone among strangers. I shall have an anxious time there, but it shall not be a long time. If possible, I shall be here to take you to Marambad, and in the meantime you must love quietly and do what your doctor tells you. He is to see you next week, remember. He held her to his heart with stronger feeling than he had shown for a long time and gave her his goodbye kiss. She flung herself on her knees as the door closed behind him. God, help me to be true to him in heart and mind. That was the prayer she breathed mutely while her tears fell thick and fast upon her clasped hands. He was gone, the unloved husband, and she had to face the peril of the undeclared lover. She felt helpless and forsaken, and she sat for a long time in listless misery, and then... Looking up at the pictures on the wall, she tried to realise that silent companionship, the souls of the illustrious dead, tried to believe that she was not alone in her dejection, that in the silence of her lonely room there was the sympathy and understanding of souls over whom death has no more dominion, and whose pity was more profound than any earthbound creature could give her. She thought of Francis Simeon, and of those meetings of which he had told her. Nothing had come of her interview with him. Claude Rutherford's light laughter had blown away her belief in the high priest of the spiritual world, and she had thought no more of the creed that had appealed so strongly to her imagination. Now, when life seemed a barren waste, 
her thoughts turned to the philosophic visionary who had so gravely expounded his dream. Everything in her material world harassed and distressed her, and she had turned to the spiritual life to escape from reality. She wrote urgently to Mr. Simeon, telling him that she was unhappy and asking to be admitted to the society of which he had told her. She had not to wait long for an answer. Simeon called upon her that afternoon and was with her for more than an hour, full of kindness and sympathy, sympathy that scared her, for it seemed as if those strange eyes must be reading the depths of her inner consciousness and all the disgust of life and vague longing that were interwoven with her thoughts of Claude Rutherford. It was to escape those thoughts, to dissever herself from that haunting image that she pleaded for admission to the shadow world. Bring me in communion with the great minds that are above earthly passions, would be her prayer, could she have spoken freely. But she sat in a thoughtful silence, soothed by the spiritualist exposition of that dream world, which was to him more real than the solid earth upon which he had to live, a reluctant participator in the life of the vulgar herd. The mass of mankind who have no joys that are not sensual and who live only in the present moment have nothing but ridicule and disbelief for the faith that makes even this sordid material world beautiful for us, who see in earthly things the image of things supernal. He said, with that accent of sincerity, that intense conviction which had made scoffers cease from scoffing under the influence of his personality, however they might ridicule him in his absence. Everyone had to admit that, though the creed might be absurd, the man was wonderful. There was to be a meeting of us at his chambers on the following afternoon, and Simeon begged Vera to come. You may find only thought and silence, he said, a company of friends absorbed in meditation, but without any message from the other world, or you may hear words that burn, the voices of disembodied genius. In any case, while you are with us, you will be away from the dust and traffic of the material world. Yes, she would go. She was only too glad to be allowed to be among his disciples. I want to escape, she told him. I am tired of my futile life so tired. I thought you would have joined us long ago, he said as he took leave, but I think I know the influence that held you back. The hot blood rushed into your face, the red fire of conscious guilt that always came at the thought of Claude Rutherford. She had never minimised her sin. It was sin to have made him essential to her happiness, to have lost interest in all the rest of her life, to have given him her heart and mind. I think the psychological moment has come, continued Simeon's slow, grave voice, and that you should now become one of us. You have drained the cup of this trivial life and have found its bitterness. Our religion is our faith in the afterlife. We have the faith that looks through death. The orthodox Christian talks of the life beyond, and we must give him credit for sometimes thinking of it. But does he realise it? Is it near him? Does he look through death to the spirit world beyond? Does he realise the afterlife as Christ realised it when he talked with his disciples? End of chapter 8, part 2. Recording by Sarah in Brighton.